sure. Yeah, I guess we're in here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the official living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. My name is James Person. Uh, I run the center's North Korea International Documentation Project, which is part of the History and Pol Public Policy Program under Christian Osterman. Uh, before we get started, I, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, this workshop series. Um, this is the third in a series of, of workshops NKIDP has held with the United States Institute of Peace um, over the course of a year or so. Um, by combining NKIDP's vast resources uh, of former communist bloc archival documents um, on the inner workings and foreign relations of, of North Korea with USIP's up-to-date analysis of current events, we strive to provide a broader historical perspective to issues affecting the Korean Peninsula today. Prior to each of these events, NKIDP releases a collection of translated archival documents uh, in an effort to have, uh, to have a more engaged or more informed discussion. Two weeks ago, the project released a collection of 39 South Korean, East German, Bulgarian, and Romanian documents on inter-Korean relations in the early 1970s. These documents were released in Seoul, and made quite a splash in, in, in South Korean academic circles and in the media. Since the collection is some 168 pages, we did not print out uh, copies. Um, uh, it, uh, we did make some other uh, uh, document readers available, but uh, this one, if, if you would like a copy, um, it is available uh, online. You can download it at uh, www.wilsoncenter.com dot org backslash nkidp um, if you'd like a hard copy uh, please send your um, or send an email to um, with with your name and mailing address to nkidp at wilsoncenter dot org we'd be happy to mail you a copy now it seems fitting that we're holding this panel today I mean we really time this well, I think. Um, Red Cross officials uh, from from North and South Korea will resume meetings on Friday. Uh, to regularize the reunions of, of families long dispersed and uh, on the divided Korean Peninsula. Um, just yesterday, North Korea expressed regrets uh, over the deaths of, of six South Koreans uh, caused by the, the abrupt uh, discharge of, of dam water on the Imjin River last month. Also on Wednesday, the, uh, uh, North Korea's um, Nodong Shinmun uh, called for better ties with South Korea. Um, so there seems to be some some real movement um, uh, in interrelation or interkorean relations today. Now, before turning things over to John, allow me to um, uh, to to quickly note that this event is also being held in cooperation with the Center's Asia program. Um, I would also like to thank NKDP's small but uh, but dedicated team um, of staff, especially uh, my colleague Tim McDonald, um, as well as the project's interns and and research assistants. Um, including uh, Katie Radeva, Will Kamovich, Nick Turner, and Jun Kim. Um, so without further ado, I will turn things over to John Park, uh, Senior Research Associate uh, with USIP's Center for Conflict Analysis and Prevention. John. Thank, you. thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you all for coming today on this uh, cold and rainy day. Uh, as uh, James was saying, I'd really like to echo the uh, pleasure that we've had in ho jointing, uh, joint hosting this event with uh, NKIDP in uh, the third series now. Uh, we've looked to really combine the past and the present, and today is definitely, as James also mentioned, a timely gathering. I won't spend too much time in my comments here, but uh, very quickly introduce our first speaker. Baron Schaefer is a senior scholar with the Woodrow Wilson Center's uh, Cold War International History Project and a former research fellow at the German Historical Institute in uh, Washington. The uh, two publications that I draw your attention to are North Korean Adventurism and China's Long Shadow, 1966 to 1972, and uh, his upcoming uh, publications, which he'll be talking about in his uh, talk as well. So, Van, if I can turn it off to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming. It's really awful weather outside. I can testify to that. I will talk briefly about uh, a publication I am hoping it's going to come out with NKIDP uh, pretty soon, together with another paper project by Professor Shin, who will talk about his uh, research uh, after, after me. Um, it's about the historical 
origins of North Korean uh, unification policy with regard to inter-Korean dialogue and inter-Korean talks, and uh, it will be about the crucial period between 1971 and 1975. Between 1971 and 1975, or let's say between 1971 and 1973, North Korea had basically its last best chance to unify the Korean Peninsula under its own auspices, and uh, it, it planned uh, for that event, and I'm going to talk about that. The publication, which will come out at some point with NKIDP, will be much more detailed in sources uh, and in uh, further information. So I will just give a brief overview uh, of uh, what this publication uh, will finally be about. Um, I will talk briefly about the China factor in uh, North Korean China in North Korean uh, China relations in 1971. Then about this joint declaration of the two uh, Korean states of 4th of July 1972, and then about uh, basically the abortion of uh, inter-Korean dialogue through various uh, domestic uh, uh, issues uh, in South Korea uh, primarily. Um, as I said, uh, 1971. Uh, in 1971, North Korea saw, for for two reasons, uh, a major chance to reunify the Korean Peninsula under its own auspices, with the final goal of having Kim Il Sung uh, being the leader of a unified uh, uh, North Korea. Uh, and until then, at least particularly in the 60s, uh, North Korea had still uh, followed, a, uh, let's say, a strategy to, to foster revolution in South Korea and to help this revolution with military means or provoking some sort of military conflict in which the Soviet Union and China would aid North Korea and somehow uh, bring a reunification about. Uh, all this didn't lead uh, to anywhere, but uh, North Korea embarked uh, on some strategy of adventurism, military adventurism, until about 1969, uh, 1970. 1971 was a crucial year for two major reasons. First of all, there was a presidential election in South Korea, which was half free or basically free to some uh, extent. And the opposition candidate, Kim Dae-jung, uh, did extremely well against the uh, president and dictator, so to speak, Park Chung-hee. And this really opened certain eyes in North Korea that there might be a chance, with the help of what they thought were favorable conditions in South Korea, to overthrow the regime of Park uh, Chung-hee. But the other more important event was uh, actually Sino-American rapprochement. And I will uh, uh, present this into, in more detail uh, in my, uh, in my uh, forthcoming uh, paper and publication. Uh, the Kissinger visit uh, to uh, secret visit to uh, China in uh, in July 1971, uh, was a major uh, was a major event, uh, which opened the chance for North Korea to have a sort of uh, dialogue process uh, on the Korean Peninsula and maybe achieve the withdrawal of the Americans from South Korea. Uh, they got encouraged in this regard by China. I will show in the paper that there were very close talks and consultations between North Korea and China after the Kissinger visit. Uh, North Korea was not informed beforehand about the upcoming visit, but once it happened, North Korea was uh, the only socialist ally of, uh, of China which came out forcefully in, in favor of Nixon's visit to China because North Korea saw a chance to reunify the peninsula by finally getting rid of the American presence um, in South uh, Korea. Um, I don't want to tell you too much details in too many documents, I can, can refer to that later in case you have any questions uh, on, on, that, on that. But uh, suffice it to they, uh, say that it took uh, North Korea, a North Korean leader, uh, only a couple of weeks before, they, before he came up publicly on August 6, 1971, and uh, start uh, and uh, call for a round of inter-Korean talks and welcoming Nixon's visit uh, to China, which he interpreted, of course, in, in a very uh, special way as a sort of surrender of the uh, capitalist world to China, and he will come as a de defeated and with a white flag of surrender, he finally has to kowtow before Beijing. But this was just rhetoric. Actually, North Korea was even optimistic it might have a chance to see Nixon uh, when he came to China uh, during the entire visit of Nixon to China. North Korea had a delegation, a high-ranking delegation there in Beijing on site, and they were in close contact with the Chinese, and they hoped if the opportunity would arise, they would have a chance to meet, actually, Nixon's delegation, which didn't come about, but it just uh, showed how much hopes uh, they, they had uh, 
with that, with that event. Well, for different reasons, we will hear that later from Professor Shin. South Korea also was in favor at that point uh, because South Korea was very much afraid of this you know, American opening. South Korea was also in favor of inter-Korean uh, talk and the uh, Red Cross negotiations had started uh, in 1971 uh, between both Korean states and uh, they led finally to some first secret high-ranking meetings, uh, both in Pyongyang and Seoul, uh, which uh, in the end led to this uh, quite spectacular declaration of uh, 4th of July 1972 between uh, two, two Korean states for the unification of the father, uh, fatherland. Um, and it was a, a major milestone for North Korean strategy. Now, what I'm outlining in this paper beyond what is known publicly are those internal deliberations and uh, strategies and hopes and aspirations which North Korea harbored with this inter-Korean dialogue policy and with this unification uh, declaration of 4th of July 1972. And we know much more about this now because we have the archives of the former communist allies of North Korea, East Germany, but also Romania, uh, Bulgaria, uh, where the North Korean uh, government and party officials and Kim Il-sung even in personal talks with uh, uh, communist leaders like Romanians, uh, dictator Ch Ceausescu, uh, really uh, laid down his insights and his uh, hopes uh, for, the, uh, for how a unification of the Korean Peninsula could be achieved. And they gave a lot of internal briefings to uh, socialist diplomats in Pyongyang, and we have all the kind of documentation on that. Some of those documents are in this document reader, which uh, James Person uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned at the beginning. Uh, they basically show that the North Korean strategy was uh, to, to, break, uh, to, 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 to break the control of the South Korean regime on how South Korea can be exposed or not exposed to North Korean thoughts, to uh, North Korean uh, officials, and to North Korean policy. So North Korea hoped, North Korea was convinced if the people in South Korea would be able to get some sort of unfettered information about how North Korea is superior in every regard to South Korea, this will lead to a sort of uh, unification drive in the South, which uh, the President Park Chung-hee cannot resist. Uh, the, uh, we have this in many uh, documents where Kim Il-sung said basically the score is two to one in favor for us because about 80% of the people in South Korea are in favor of our system. This is one. The other one are the people of North Korea who are all behind, behind the leader. And the, the other one, uh, the only one uh, on the opposite side uh, is basically Park Chung-hee and his minions and the military in South Korea who can hold on to power. So if there would be an open dialogue process uh, where a, a broad array of forces uh, from society, not just Park Chung-hee, but from South Korean society would be involved into a dialogue process uh, with uh, North Korean representatives from parties and mass organizations. Uh, this will lead uh, to a process where you will have at some point a confederation between both Korean states, then probably an election, new election in South Korea, which will result in the defeat of Park Chung-hee, and then followed by a national election uh, in all of Korea, which will uh, favor uh, the system of the North. The North was at this time quite aware that the economic situation in South Korea was going to improve dramatically. These were those crucial years when uh, South Korea for the first time uh, came, came even with North Korea in terms of economic performance around 1969, 1970, and from the early to mid-70s, South Korea was surpassing North Korea and really zooming way ahead. And North Korea was very much afraid, and if they don't achieve reunification at this point, the economic gap would widen so much that North Korea would not have really the chance to convince the majority of the people in the South to opt for the system in the North. But in the early 70s, they were still very optimistic that they could still achieve that. Uh, North Korea opted for the uh, utmost openness of uh, contacts and dialogues and exchanges between both states because it thought if people from the South would have the chance to see the North, they would immediately see who is uh, superior. And if they would have a chance to promote to the people of the South without this shield of anti-communist security laws, 
which uh, the South Korean regime had imposed, uh, they would be able to convince uh, the majority of people. Now, basically, I'm telling this about this process of dialogue, and I don't want to extend my time uh, too much, but... Of course, as we all know, this uh, didn't lead to, 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 to anywhere. But the reason why it didn't lead to anywhere was that the uh, South Korean regime under Park Chung-hee, uh, I think, uh, adapted a very cunning strategy in order to thwart these uh, North Korean efforts at having a reunification of Korea under socialist auspices under the leadership of Kim Il-sung. Uh, Park Chung-hee and, his, uh, and the uh, uh, chief of the Korean uh, CIA, Lee hoo uh had sort of conceived a strategy that they would actually engage in a dialogue with Kim Il-sung and his people, but confine it uh, to, to, to those narrow circles of the Park Chung-hee government uh, in order to, to buy certain time. And then at some point, what they finally did in 1972, uh, in November and December 1972, uh, Park Chung-hee instituted uh, emergency rule, uh, authoritarian rule uh, in, uh, in, in uh, South Korea using the pretext uh, of uh, this inter-Korean dialogue in a very uh, cunning and, uh, and clever way which led North Korea first confused and then finally extremely angry, extremely angry because uh, they realized basically that they had been uh, outfoxed in this entire process and they had helped Park Chung-hee to, to, to acquire this, uh, the status of becoming a, a dictator uh, or president, so to speak, for, for a lifetime. The same thing which Kim Il-sung always was, but it's interesting then after uh, Park Chung-hee instituted his personal rule in South Korea, uh, Kim Il-sung also started to have a new constitution for his country and uh, also to call himself president, what he didn't do before, he was prime minister, and also that he for the first time then in 1972, 1973 gave some public hints for all observers in Pyongyang that his son Kim Jong-il is uh, being uh, prepared uh, to, to follow him uh, uh, as, 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 as a leader. And this paper I'm going to uh, publish at, uh, at some point with NKADP will outline those years between 1971 and 1973, this inter-Korean dialogue process and the North Korean strategy uh, and how the North Korean strategy failed uh, because of the uh, South Korean uh, countermeasures. And the end of the paper, and this will be the end of my remarks, uh, will um, talk about the years between 1973 and 1975, when, as, as, we, as we know, the North Korean military, again, uh, after the failure of the peaceful talks, inter-Korean talks, uh, pushed for a more military solution, uh, the traditional military solution on the Korean Peninsula, which is that they... Uh, should be first a revolution in the South, started by some revolutionary communist, pro-communist forces, and then the Northern forces would come to, to, to help them, uh, that uh, this strategy basically reached a dead end in 1975. And I will also show that for a long time, actually, North Korea closely followed the events in Vietnam, saw it as a sort of inspiration and a contest, which North Korea was going to lose in many regards because Vietnam was achieving social reunification and a lot of things which North Korea did not achieve, and that Kim Il-sung, if China would have helped him, if China would have helped him in 1975, might have, as he called it, joined the tide of revolution uh, in uh, Asia. Um, when he went to China in April 75, he, he made certain remarks which really indicated that if he would be willing uh, to have a sort of uh, a military uh, uh, conflict uh, on the Korean Peninsula uh, as well uh, for revolution or liberation of uh, South Korea. But as, as we know, China did not come along, and without China's help, it wouldn't lead to much. And then it's pretty interesting, and this will be the end of my talk, uh, it will also be the end of that paper I'm going to publish that after he returned from China, he went to Eastern Europe and had uh, meetings with various Eastern European leaders, and we have some of those records. And there Kim Il-sung clearly outlined that the military option is basically out. The military option is out that North Korea will never attack first, and he gave a lot of reasons why a military victory over South Korea for reasons of uh, the forces in South Korea for the American presence but also for the uh, geography and topography of South Korea is basically impossible. Uh, that uh, North Korea's only chance is a long-term strategy that the revolutionary pro-communist forces, which of course were all 
uh, illegal in South Korea and the underground, that they, at, uh, at the end of a very long process, might be able to come close to, to, to power in South Korea, but he wasn't very optimistic on that. It's pretty, uh, he's, quite, he's quite resigned to the fact uh, by summer 1975 already that the division of Korea is now going to continue for, for a long time after this peaceful offensive, as they called it, uh, failed uh, between 1971 and 1973. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Baron. Uh, I'd like to quickly uh, welcome Professor Brzezinski, who will be our discussant. Our next speaker will be Song De, uh, Jung Dae Shin. My apologies. Uh, Professor Shin is a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center here and also professor at the University of North Korean Studies in Seoul. Uh, professor Shin's uh, core focus is North Korea's foreign relations and inter-Korean relations in the 1970s. Among his many uh, publications, uh, two key ones, the first, Principal Issues of South Korean Society and State Control, and the second one, Theory of Inter-Korean Relations. Pass it on to Professor Shin. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, I've been able to come together and talk about uh, this, uh, this important topic. All right. Uh, I'd like to raise uh, some problems uh, worth uh, considering when thinking about inter-Korean dialogue in the uh, early 1970s uh, and related uh, them to the current, current situation a little bit. Uh, uh, in particular, I will focus on the uh, motive of the North and South Korean leadership. And, and then I'll discuss uh, some internal dynamics. Uh, first, uh, um, I mean, what were the motives of uh, uh, North and South Korean leader, leaders in entering talks, in the Korean, I mean, in the Korean talks? Uh, I'll start with uh, South Korea. At first, the South, uh, South Korean President uh, Park Jong-hee uh, reluctantly accepted uh, the U.S. Uh, suggestion to talk with North Korea in order to deter another war on the uh, Korean Peninsula and to buy time for South Korean economic development. He expressed uh, displeasure uh, with the U.S. for trying to force, uh, uh, trying to achieve, uh, achieve uh, reconciliation uh, with with China and uh, forcing him to, uh, forcing him, you know, uh, talk, talks with uh, North Korea, uh, which simultaneously uh, strengthen its uh, military ties with China. However, Park later realized that he could uh, elevate his own regime's image and secure new card, new card for negotiating with the U.S. through the uh, uh, inter-Korean uh, dialogue. He came to think of uh, the talks with the North uh, as the way to recover uh, the loosening uh, U.S. alliance at the time. In the end, uh, Park also used the inter-Korean dialogue to justify uh, his uh, using Authoritarian, uh, authoritarian, uh, using authoritarian system, which was uh, launched in October 1972. Uh, in the course of a dialogue, uh, President Ba justified the, the transition to authoritarianism uh, through the uh, Yushin system uh, by announcing that Yushin was a measure uh, for promoting the efficient inter-Korean dialogue. On the level of U.S. LAC, uh, Republic of Korea, uh, U.S. LAC alliance, Park maintained that in order to effectively talk with uh, North Korea from position of uh, strength, additional withdrawal of uh, U.S. forces in Korea uh, would not be acceptable. And then U.S. must increase uh, military aid to South Korea. And just as, uh, just as the U.S. pressure uh, Park Chung-hee to engage in inter-Korean dialogue, China also encouraged uh, 
North, North Korean leader Kim Il Sung, leader Kim Il Sung, to enter in a discussion with Seoul. But Kim Il Sung did not have uh, any real interest in easing tension on the Korean Peninsula through the uh, inter Korean dialogue. His main concern was uh, a possible change in U.S. policy toward North Korea. Kim's uh, strategic so, uh, strategic interest uh, at the time was uh, still the withdrawal of uh, U.S. forces uh, from Korea and the collapse of uh, the uh, LAC U.S. Uh, US uh, alliance. Kim Il-sung launched uh, an active uh, peace offensive to take a chance to force the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Korea completely to take the initiative uh, on agenda for Korean reunification, and ultimately to force uh, Park Jong-hee to capitulate and accept uh, the terms of uh, its uh, peace offensive. Uh, North Korea's uh, uh, moment, mo momentary uh, contribution to the detente on the Korean Peninsula through the uh, inter-Korean dialogue can be in interpreted uh, in this context of its awareness, awareness of China's expectation. In other words, North Korea intended to show a kind of a gesture, just a gesture to the Chinese leadership that it had fulfilled all expectations. In turn, North Korea was expecting an active role from China as an arbitrator, a kind of a Arbitrate, arbitrate, as the U.S. did not have any intention to respond to North Korea's direct contact at the time. You know? Therefore, North Korea utilized the inner Korean dialogue, which China was expecting from North Korea the most, as, as a, a means to encourage China to, to be mediate, mediate. But North Korea's hope uh, to prompt uh, a withdrawal of U.S. forces in Korea by delivering its uh, demands uh, through, the, through China gradually began to fade. So North Korea eventually pulled out from the South-North Coordinating Committee and the uh, Red, Cross, uh, Red, uh, Red Cross Conference. And North Korea also executed uh, a series of uh, provocation, including an infiltration of armed agent uh, through the, uh, the sea and carried, uh, carry, carry out uh, an attack on the unarmed, unarmed uh, South, South Korean fishing boat in February 1974. Anyway, after that, North Korea attempted to Acknowledge the U.S. that a key solution to the Korean problem was uh, not an not an inter-Korean dialogue, which would which would cripple North Korea's uh, revolution strategy, but a transition of uh, armistice agreement to peace accord followed by withdrawal of uh, U.S. forces in Korea. In the end. On March 25, 1974, North Korea officially suggested the DPRK US peace accord to be signed. Secondly, secondly uh, let me turn to some internal dynamics of two Koreas. Uh, uh, as is uh, generally known, international and domestic factors are closely interconnected and interact with each other in the process of uh, making a country's uh, foreign policy. For example, the South's uh, proposal for inter-Korean dialogue must also simultaneously take into account a uh, multitude of inter internal or external factors. Among internal factors, uh, let me briefly review internal power, game, power games. Regarding the direction and speed of the uh, inter-Korean dialogue, uh, we must consider the conflict between Prime Minister Kim Jong-pil and KCIA Director Lee Hura. There were differences of opinion even between uh, President Park and Director Lee Hura. 
initially, you know, but engaged in into Korean dialogue to prevent uh, outbreak of uh, another war on the Korean Peninsula, and to buy time for South Korean economic development. Therefore, but very reluctantly agreed to allow Lee's Lee to secretly visit the Pyongyang, uh, visit the North Korea. As a former Blue, Blue House spokesman Kim Sung Jin explained in interview, it was the least uh, ambitions that led to uh, talks in Pyongyang. What were, what were some of the internal dynamics in North Korea? You know, this is less known. But there is an uh, argument that North Korean military adventurism resulted from the, uh, an internal power struggle in the late, uh, late 1960. Uh, According to his, uh, uh, this, uh, this argument, uh, militarist uh, hardline clique uh, uh, attempted to replace the number two person in North Korea, Kim Il-sung's uh, uh, younger brother, Kim Young-ju, and seize power themselves uh, through adventurism towards uh, the South. If this is the case, uh, can we assume that the peace offensive of early 1970 resulted from a power struggle by Madrid? I don't think so. It is important to remember that North Korea was uh, nearly one man show. The early 1970 was uh, the height of the so-called uh, monolithic system. But one other thing worth uh, uh, noting is that both governments had to consider the position of uh, their militaries. Indeed, uh, before and after uh, signing of the July 4th uh, uh, North-South uh, joint, uh, joint Communique, the Park regime faced uh, criticism from the uh, military regarding its uh, promotion of inter-Korean dialogue. North Korea Foreign Minister Park Seung chul also claimed uh, in meeting with, uh, meetings with Li Hura that the North Korean military also did not welcome the sudden reconciliation with the South. Needless to say, inter-Korean dialogue served the interest of uh, both sides of ruling circles. While at talks, Park Chung-hee and Kim Il-sung respectively undertook measures that strengthened their grips of power. Finally, I'd like to close by give, uh, giving some lessons from inter-Korean dialogue in the early 1970s. First, uh, the cooperation between China and North Korea during the sino us rapprochement should be understood in the context of a DPRK's uh, desire to approach the U.S. through the uh, China and China, and its uh, intention to fulfill China's uh, expectation to ease tension, tensions in Korean Peninsula through the uh, inter-Korean dialogue. On the other hand, North Korea did not have a genuine intention to improve inter-Korean relations. Rather, it sought to or reach a bilateral peace treaty with the U.S., a withdrawal of U.S. troops from Korea, and disrupt the lack U.S. alliance. Even these days, even these days, the sino U.S. cooperative framework that has emerged to induce the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and to encourage the DPRK to join the international community and China's role as a Arbitrate, uh, 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 arbitrate, arbitrate are uh, uh, obstacles uh, for North Korea to reach direct political negotiation with U.S. North Korea does not, I mean, North Korea, North Korea does not want China to emerge as a central player in the management scheme of the North Korea. And second, South Korea were more conscious about peace building and exchanges and wanted to avoid direct, directly 
tackling the unification matter at the time. So the basic assumption was that economic and social exchanges will eventually favor the way for gradual political integration. At this point, the Sunshine Policy uh, Habit uh, you know, conducted by the uh, Kim Dae-jung administration, uh, Sunshine Policy's uh, functional approach can be said to have uh, originated from the uh, July 7 joint communique. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sunwon Park. Uh, he has a PowerPoint presentation, so I invite the members of the committee to uh, the panel to sit down in the front row. Uh, quick word about Dr. Park's background. He's a noted expert in international relations and national security, uh, and as a practitioner, he has very unique insights. He had served uh, in the Republic of Korea government as senior director for national security strategy and planning, and also as secretary to the president for national security strategy. So, Dr. Park. Thank you very much. My name is Sonom Park, and I'm very much privileged to have a chance to read this big volume about the hidden history, especially between North Korea and its allies, including China, the Soviet Union, and other East European countries. Um, I have also read some volumes declassified by the State Department on the role of the United States towards the dialogue between North and South Korea during this exactly the same period. So my topic is that what is the uh, influence of changing external environment on the uh, dialogue or confrontation or changing dynamics of inter-Korean relations? And so I have, I'm gonna you know, uh, make a very quick uh, presentation as soon as possible. Uh, there are two parts, part one is the Cold War era, and the second part is the post-Cold War era, in, including the present present time. So uh, as Dr. Schaefer said that uh, in late 1960s, the uh, power structure in Northeast Asia was very much tilted in favor of uh, North Korean side. And Soviet Union on top of the uh, vantage point, high ground, in this uh, strategic triangle between the Ch Soviet Union, the United States, China. And South Korea was uh, fighting in Vietnam for uh, United States, but the United States decided to withdraw its forces from South Korea significantly. And North Korea believed that it was a high tide of revolution movement in a global level. So therefore, uh, in the general outlook, the security landscape was very much in favor of Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. And because of Vietnam quagmire, as you all know, the United States was in a relatively defense position and South Korea also in the same, same position. And uh, in very early 1970s, especially in 1971-72, the uh, United States tried to recover its, its position within the strategic triangle by uh, taking rapprochement with China. After that, uh, quickly, the uh, United States moved to uh, you know, initiate the tank with Soviet Union. So Nixon visited China in February, uh, 1972, and, and also Nixon visited Moscow to meet his counterpart in May, 19, May 1972. So in so doing, uh, United States see it, said on the very much comfortable position that he had a good relationship with China and Soviet Union. However, Soviet Union and China still uh, was in a political and ideological war, including a border conflict. So, Within this picture, uh, South Korea was the uh, you know, uh, weakest partner. Uh, South Korea has a bad relationship with the United States, and uh, of course, uh, adversarial with Soviet Union, China, and with North Korea, uh, you know, uh, because of the uh, uh, North Korea special commanders raid into the Blue House and their infiltration of special forces into the northern part of South Korean territory, Gangwon area, and therefore, uh, South Korea was very much um, reluctant to open any dialogue with North Korea. However, there was no other choice but to accept American pressure to take a dialogue to open its, its door. 
towards North Korea. So as Dr. Schaefer and Professor Shin said, that under U.S. pressure, an ROK government took a very passive posture <laughs> in opening its, its door towards North Korea. Um, as the professor uh, has already presented, at that time the cooperation between China and, and North Korea was really vivid. So uh, almost every year Kim Il-sung visited uh, Beijing every year, once every year. And in the uh, mid-July, when uh, Kissinger was there in Beijing, and as Dr. Schaefer says that uh, North Korean uh, Secretary of the Korean Workers' Party, Kim Jong-un, uh, stayed in Beijing and tried to meet the, any chance uh, to work with or talk with uh, American delegation. And then uh, on-site debriefing was possible from Chinese sides to North Korean delegation. And right after July, they briefed Kissinger's visit to Kim Il-sung by his own visit to Pyongyang. And, and therefore, uh, using this you know, kind of a peace offensive, uh, Kim Il-sung could initiate, uh, could, could initiate that uh, I'm, I'm willing to uh, dialogue with South Korea, uh, any uh, individuals, entities, and political parties, including the Democratic Republican Party. So uh, there was no other choice for uh, Park Jong-hee but to accept this uh, peace offensive in his own way. So uh, North Korean uh, strategic goal was relatively simple, adapting to the PRC-US rapprochement, initiate the unification issues and withdrawal while pushing out the US uh, forces in Korea. Well, as you know, the US pressure was very much strong, especially in the late 1960s and early 1970s, up until uh, 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 January and February 1972, uh, just when Nixon met uh, his counterpart, Chinese counterpart Mao Zedong. So uh, the M U.S. Uh, embassy to Seoul uh, exerted his uh, maximum influence by saying that while ROK did not actively respond to North Korean peace offensive, and what do you think about uh, you know, a peace offensive from North Korea? And what are you going to do? Why don't you have a direct talk and contact with North Korea? In February 1970, Ambassador Porter and Assistant Secretary Brown told before the Senate that we are exerting you know, a pressure and we have a very quiet discussion with South Korean leadership. And some time is, is now ripe. Um, and so uh, Park Jong-hee chose that he declare his initiative to, for promotion of foundation to the peaceful unification. And however, the pushes from uh, Foro has been increasing. So uh, he said that we need a more active method than quiet persuasion, and a little more leverage should be demanded and employed. Because and that we should not we should not be passive and less generous, but we should be more aggressive. And even he was very much critical on, in early January in 1972 that President Park is even more rigid to w talk with North Koreans, uh, just a, around one month before Nixon's visit to Beijing. So uh, our case, especially Park jong his option was very simple, passive bandwagoning to uh, U.S. rapprochement with China, and Park Jong-un regime utilized this improvement of inter-Korean relations as opportune to his perpetual ruling, as you have already uh, discussed. And there was a very uh, interesting uh, remarks made by Iraq, uh, who informed the United States, no, no, North Korea, in advance of the announcement of a martial law and the uh, Yushin Constitution on, on motions, that the Iraq said that at the beginning of the uh, 1970s, uh, in the ambient setting for Korea, uh, some changes took place. So national issues need to be resolved independently without support of foreign powers. And even he said that for the emergency statement, the U.S. and Japan was opposed. But therefore, he, they informed just two hours before the... Uh, official announcement. And he also said that we decided to institute the Juche system 
in the spirit of national self-determination raised by Premier Kim Il-sung. Right? So, um, so like this, uh, Kim Jong, Kim Il Park Jung hees a focal point was to enhance his political legitimacy and political foothold right after his a, a very small margin victory against Kim Dae Jung in 1971. So I'm going to skip, and I'm going to skip again. But here is the uh, uh, Kim Il Sung's mentions that Kim Il Sung really was really believed that it is a one of best time for both Koreas to cooperate. So if we correctly you know, uh, translate it, this word is in Korean hapjak, is a coalition. And the burdens of military expense needs to be the first issue for us to resolve. And South Korea receives around US, US $250 million from the United States, but uh, North Korea uh, did not receive any foreign aid. Therefore, it's a, a lot of problem for North, North Korea. Therefore, they want to have a coexistence policy or peaceful offensives. So he, he really uh, re revealed his own mind at this time. So you know, wrapping up all these bunch of things, the U.S. made a very good comment at the end of year 2072 that at any rate, Pyongyang behaved prudently to the domestic politics of Park Jong-hee after the announcement of the system and, and the ROK government probably before talking to the U.S., notified to North Korea on the martial law of October 17th, and maybe let them know the long-term ruling of Park Jong-hee himself and the plan on the consolidation of political power. So, so the uh, utility of inter-Korean dialogue has been gone. After uh, uh, Nixon visited Beijing successfully in February and, and Moscow in May 1972. So July 1st joint statement was very much ominous from the uh, U.S. point of view because they too much emphasize their self-determination and then great national uni solidarity and peaceful uh, uh, unification. And right after July 1st joint statement, North Korea began to demand the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Korea, using this as a pretext to force uh, Park Jong-un regime to stop, to stop inter-Korean dialogue. So uh, during this period of time, uh, uh, U.S. pressure towards South Korea to open a dialogue with North Korean government was politically, diplomatically expedient, which is the same as to the South Korean government. And I'm going to skip uh, the demise of Park jong -hee and I will move to the post-Cold War era. And Early 1990s and until June 1994, uh, North Korea faced a dual crisis internally and externally, internally, security, and, ex and economically, and also externally, the demise of the communist bloc. So uh, North Korea was in the corner. Therefore, North Korea should you know, uh, re re uh, start their initiatives towards South Korea. So there is a very simple uh, tendency that once international uh, and security landscape changes, and South Korea and North Korea are relatively weak partner in the regional politics compared with the United States, Japan, China, and Soviet Union. Therefore, they should find a way to cope with this changing international environment. The best way is to talk with other side of the Korean Peninsula, that is inter-Korean dialogue. So when things change drastically, when things uh, turn out to be very much negative or uncomfortable or disadvantageous, then one of the side in the Korean Peninsula asks the other side to open the direct context and dialogue. That's the uh, usual, usual tendencies, which is also the case even today. And I'm going to skip this, and, and there was a second and a crisis which starts from July 94 till uh, October 2000. Uh, Kim, Kim Il-sung died, and North Korea should start this so-called March of Audio. So they must accelerate to improve their relations with the United States and also with South Korea. 
uh, the Clinton administration and the Kim Dae-jung and Kim Young-sam administration. So uh, uh, during the period of uh, Kim Jong-il and Clinton and Kim Dae-jung period, the U.S. ROK relationship was one of the be best. The U.S. Chinese relationship also improved, and then inter-Korean relationship uh, will be recorded on of the top. Right? So in so doing, uh, North Korea could um, get rid of economic and political crisis, and also South Korean government initiated its own plan of reconciliation and cooperation program towards North Korea, thereby could exert its own leadership for the future uh, Korean Peninsula uh, after you know, even uh, the end of the Cold War structure. And the Bush administration era uh, was a, another you know, a wave of a crisis to North Korean point of view. So the option was two. One is to go nuclear, and second was to maintain good relationship with China and South Korea. And the uh, South Korean government, the Romanian government, was very much uh, afraid of any possible uh, milit military conflict between the uh, United St States and North Korea. Therefore, uh, therefore, in the first term of the Bush administration, the South Korean government rather played as a, a middleman between the uh, United States and North Korea in closely working with China. Uh, in the second term, uh, South Korea uh, improved its own relationship with the United States. Therefore, uh, uh, United States and ROK could have uh, some uh, joint approach towards North Korea in the process of the six-party talks and thereby um, uh, produced a, a, a September 19th joint statement and February 13th agreement and October 1st agreement. And now... Uh, there are a uh, first wave of crisis. North Korea is the only country which has not opened its own door towards outsiders and, and, and very much resistance to take uh, reform policies, but uh, uh, their leadership was still in power. Therefore, uh, they faced almost always chronic crisis. <laughs> and f since August 28th and until uh, July uh, 2009, I mean, uh, two months ago, and North Korea uh, passed through a, a unprecedented political crisis, one coming from external shock and another uh, from uh, a leadership crisis. So now uh, North Korea uh, want to open a, a test, want to uh, test water. How could it, they want to improve their relationship with the Bush Obama administration? while slightly uh, you know, um, uh, touching upon the possibility uh, towards the reconciliation with the uh, South Korean government and the uh, Japanese government. So from a uh, South Korean point of view, I think that uh, there are uh, two contending approaches during the Cold War era and post-Cold War era. One is vision for the future of Korean Peninsula and, and the extended and expanding in a positive, preemptive role of Korean government. I believe that Rotte presidency, Kim Dae-jung, and Roman presidency represent these uh, approaches. That uh, during this time, in general, uh, U.S. ROK relationship was stable and good. And North and South Korea relationship also been um, improved. In so doing, uh, uh, South Korean government exerted its own leadership in the Korean questions, including in the nuclear problem. Um, another approach could be called a Cold War mindset, uh, which has a more prone to uh, confrontational views than Park Jong-in era, uh, Kim jong sam era, and also uh, some part of the Im young bak government. So uh, during this period of time, a U.S. ROK relationship has al always, you know, uh, up and down, and then uh, North and South Korean relationship also shows the uh, type of roller coasting. So, uh, having said that, uh, changes of external environments, environment force the two Koreas to, to cooperate in order for each side to evade or avoid or escape uh, new challenges. Thereby, they want to take uh, some breathing room to cope with the uh, very rapidly changing uh, international environment. 
So I, I believe that the change just begins. So it was reported, as he said, that uh, the, uh, there was a, a talks uh, between uh, 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 working level uh, militaries and, and the Red Cross context started. And, and traditionally, or well, conventionally, uh, July is a very important political season in North Korea because they uh, tend to hold a collective deliberation in Korean word Chonghua. So uh, in early uh, mid, uh, from early to mid July, uh, they uh, congregate from the key uh, internal uh, organizations, then uh, they review the uh, situation, the state of inter-Korean relationship, and their relationship with other countries, including China, U.S., and Japan. And then they uh, set up uh, some policy lines based upon uh, they start uh, anything, a confrontation or, or the uh, reconciliation. So I believe that uh, North Korea has already decided to take a rather uh, a reconciliatory path, not confrontation approaches that had been adopted uh, during August last year till uh, uh, early July this year. So uh, what is the path? I believe that there are two paths open to the Lee Myung-bak government. The path one is the continuation to be a prisoner of the Cold War mindset and then the South Korean strategic rollback and very offensive and aggressive posture towards Kim Jong-il regime. And Kim Jong-il regime will respond in kind and also will tactically maneuver uh, that just the, you know, intermittent uh, uh, improve of inter-Korean relationship as a stepping stone to move to the uh, direct contact with the United States. So. Uh, uh, there are a strong support from China and the possibility of new possibility of uh, diplomatic you know, dialogue with Japan, then South Korea could be tertiary position. So uh, when uh, uh, Imeong-bak government continues to be a prisoner of Cold War mindset, then North Korea utilize its own uh, approach towards South Korea uh, for the next step towards uh, um, United States, China, and Japan. And there is a second path that is to adjust its stance, embracing two previous government's policies, because I, I work for the previous governments. So uh, then I believe that there is a really a, a window of opportunities overcoming the legacy of the Korean War. Then uh, uh, even so, I believe that there will be a very critical perception gap between Im Myung-bak government and Kim Jong-il regime. Therefore, uh, still, I believe that the uh, locomotive to lead the uh, whole you know, uh, uh, bunch of changes, positive changes in Northeast Asian security landscape will be the bilateral relationship be between North Korea and Japan, no, no, North Korea and United States, North Korea and China. However, uh, Korea is the, one of the most important real entity in the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, the decision will be uh, the decision made by the Lee myung government will decide the future uh, direction of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Park. In the remaining time, uh, if I could turn to our commentator, Prof uh, Professor Brzezinski, uh, if you could take about 10 minutes, would that work? And then we'll open it up to uh, question and answer. Thank you. Okay, yes, I'll, I'll try to keep this uh, brief and um, maybe less than 10 minutes because I know we want to have time for discussion. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center again for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here and apologize for being late. Uh, I was teaching beforehand. Uh, but um, I think it's, it's also great to hear these three um, extremely uh, empirically rich and analytically sophisticated presentations, uh, all of which show the benefits of the hundreds of new documents that have been declassified and come from South Korea, East Germany, China, and other places to help us to build a much better understanding of the international politics of the Korean Peninsula than we had previously. 
Uh, at the same time, though, as I, I read these three papers and then heard the presentation, I, I was also reminded a little bit of the story of the blind uh, scholars and the elephant, uh, where one blind man uh, feels the elephant's uh, tusk and says, oh, it must be very smooth and uh, hard, and, and one of them feels the elephant's trunk and says, no, no, it's long and uh, muscular. Uh, and um, it, because all of these uh, papers sort of, uh, they, they look at what caused uh, the 1972 uh, improvements or, or summit between North and South Korea, but they do them from different perspectives. Uh, Barron's paper gives us a great amount of new detail about the rationale of North Korea. Uh, and he finds, uh, by using the East German documents, he finds some uh, incredibly fascinating new details about the relationship between North and South Korea and North Korea's motives. Uh, I don't know if he mentioned it uh, in his presentation, but he actually found something I found particularly fascinating, uh, this document that, that shows that uh, uh, Park Chung-hee actually sort of signals to Kim Il-sung that he's going to implement the Yushin system. I think it's a day or two before he, he actually makes the decision. So, I mean, there's a lot of fascinating new details there. Uh, the question I would ask him is, uh, what, what, what's fascinating is his analysis of the North Koreans and what they get wrong and what they get right. Uh, I think it's interesting that the North Koreans, a lot of times in your paper, as they analyze Park Chung-hee, and Park Chung-hee's government, they, they have a pretty good idea of what his motives and policies are. But when the North Koreans talk about the South Korean people, their analysis, at least as I see it, is uh, very off. I mean, they still think that there is some potential that the South Koreans are going to rise up and demand reunification. So I'm, I, I, I find it sort of interesting that they can, their, their analysis of the government is uh, somewhat is so much more in, is so much more sophisticated and accurate than their understanding of the Korean people. Uh, and then uh, Professor Shin's paper uh, also contributes greatly to our understanding, uh, but of, of the inter-Korean summit, but does so from an entirely different perspective. Instead of sort of giving us a better understanding of North Korea and emphasizing you know, North Korean motives, it places a much greater understanding on South Korea and South Korea's motive, uh, and, and Park Chung-hee's motives. And it's, it's very interesting that he sort of uh, demonstrates this new dynamic, that it's not just a product of U.S. policy, but he also talks about in the paper how Park had his own motives. He also believes uh, that he, he also believed that by pursuing peace, you could create a window of opportunity for uh, for Yushin and for the implementation of new uh, domestic policies that would strengthen his rule at home. Uh, and then the final uh, presentation by Professor Park. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't see the paper ahead of time. But again, uh, it's interesting because it's yet another perspective on why does this event happen? Why in 1972 to 1973 do you get an inter-Korean dialogue all of a sudden? And whereas um, uh, Byrne's paper and Professor Shin's paper were looking at it more from the perspective of specific actors, uh, in Professor Park's paper, he takes a more a broader, more structural approach, and he argues that the external environment forces uh, actually force the two Koreas to cooperate. Uh, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, I think uh, individually all of these papers are good. I think we still need to sort of uh, put these three papers together and think about them a little bit in synthesis. And, and when you put them all together, you know, what emerges as the most important themes? I think there's, there's a few things that are, uh, well, 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 I think there's two things. I think one thing that's left out and one more sort of general comment that I have. I think, first of all, in terms of what's left out, uh, we have... Uh, sort of a, you know, we, we have, the, they, they go into detail about U.S.-South Korean relations, Sino-DPRK relations, and the structure. But I think if you're going to assess why this happens, you also have to look at Sino-American relations, and especially 
at Sino-American diplomacy towards the Korean Peninsula in 1972 to 1973. I think uh, I don't think any of the papers used the new documents. Uh, first of all, uh, the the new documents. Uh, not so new anymore, but ha but that that were declassified five or six years of, ago about uh, U.S. policy towards China during the Nixon administration. Uh, I think those those documents also shed a lot of light on why you get this summit because they show very specifically that Americans and Chinese talked about the need to have greater stability on the Korean Peninsula. Both Washington and Beijing were actually really worried that a new conflagration on the peninsula would draw them in and it would be dangerous for their security. So that was, that's one of the things. Uh, I guess the final thing though is we've spent, you know, an hour and a half talking about uh, the 72 to 73 uh, negotiations and summits, but, you know, it's. I always, when, whenever we discuss this, I always wonder about if, if it's going to, if it's sort of much ado about nothing, uh, because in the end, what was seventy two to seventy three? You have this very brief period of inter Korean dialogue, but then by you know the end of nineteen seventy three, even though there's detente going out bro more broad, detente is going on more broadly in the international context. But that doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean, you know, that, that, that momentum towards improved relation actually fizzles pretty quickly on the Korean Peninsula. So one, uh, you know, I think these papers explain why does that happen. Uh, I think we need some analysis of why, you know, there's no detente on Kore in Korea, but there can be detente between the great powers. Uh, I also think, you know, the big question that historians always like to ask is, the so what question. Uh, we have a better understanding of what brought the two Koreas together, but what was the ultimate historical significance of that? And uh, the only thing that, that comes to mind is the Korean historian Kang Man Gil, who actually does make a case that there was a lasting significance to uh, the 72-73 negotiations because uh, it allowed uh, it created a window in which you could have uh, the articulation of uh, what's called Pyeonghwa uh, Tongyilron, or peaceful reunification uh, theory. And it allowed the idea in, in 72 and 72 to 73, you have the idea of peaceful reunification, uh, which had sort of been suppressed and not allowed and, and wasn't really talked about much in either the North or South. Uh, all of a sudden, it was talked about again. And it created a, uh, you know, it, it created some uh, positive impetus for uh, further North Korean, uh, di uh, further North-South Korean dialogues to proceed along those lines uh, later on. So uh, that's really all I have to say. I'll uh, turn it back over to John. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm in the awkward position of uh, giving Professor Brzezinski's bio now, but uh, very briefly, uh, he's uh, Associate <laughs> Professor of History and International Affairs at the George Washington University, uh, specialist on U.S.-East Asian relations during the Cold War. Uh, and I think very unique about his background is that he is one of the very few, uh, uh, few and for, uh, first to look at uh, the South Korean economic and political uh, democratic development and his book, uh, Nation Building in South Korea, Koreans, Americans, and the making of a democracy. Uh, I will very, very briefly turn it over to our three speakers uh, if they would like some, uh, a little bit of time to respond to Professor Brzezinski's questions, but I, I would really ask you to be very brief and then we can uh, turn to the audience for questions. Uh, starting to my immediate left, Dr. Park. Uh, um, as, as Dr. Brzezinski said that uh, the the experience during 1971 and 72 opened the very important and remained very important precedence that they began to talk about the peaceful way of reunification and they already uh, set up the standard operation or, or procedure that how they could start the inter-Korean talks using Red Cross and then sending a special envoy secretly and then reaching up to the summit level. So these things of SOP is, is remaining the same even today. And then, and then just because of President Park Jung initiative, 
initiated the inter-Korean dialogue at some degree. Uh, thereafter, uh, that uh, any Koreans, conservatives or progressives, should say about peaceful reunification and talks direct talks with North Korea. So I think, the, in a sense, uh, it demands some important precedences. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, two quick comments to Greg Brzezinski's excellent uh, remarks. Um, why did North Korea get it wrong with regard to how to, to assess the, uh, the mood in the South Korean population? I think this is uh, the, because North, Korean, not, North Korea has a concept of unification as being the main interest of the people, basically based on that people are mainly concerned about their nation, about their ethnicity or their race, and this is actually overriding any social and economic concerns. And of course, this is what they actually got wrong, because people in South Korea had certain interests, which were also economic, uh, in terms of living standards and all kinds of other, other issues, and certainly not like the North Koreans thought that just the, the fact that you have the chance to unify the peninsula would override any other concerns you might have with your own uh, well-being. Um, and uh, on what's, what's really important about the 72, 73 uh, period, to, 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 to my mind, uh, the most important thing is uh, that North Korea is basically losing its offensive momentum. It was, from my, my opinion, the last chance for North Korea to achieve unification on its own terms. After that, it was basically over, and the economic gap widened, and then North Korea's only interest is survival and uh, avoid any collapse or absorption, as we have currently the situation. Uh, but the, the offensive momentum was definitely lost, and this was, it was a good chance in 71, 72, but South Korea was able to thwart it, basically. Great. Thank you. And Professor Shin. Uh, I'm going to emphasize uh, uh, just one point uh, uh, at the time, uh, Park Chung Yee's emphasis uh, on the state security crisis uh, was uh, just not aiming at his own regime's uh, security. I mean, it based the, based on on the uh, uh, self perception from the uh, U.S. Uh, China rapprochement and uh, peace offensive conducted by North Korea. Uh, as you can see, by emphasizing its uh, peaceful Im image through the uh, inter Korean talks, North Korea expected to escape from isolation uh, from, from, from other nations, uh, and particularly to weaken South Korea's uh, anti communist institutions and help from uh, united front within South Korea. So, I mean, uh, we can say that uh, Park Chung-hee firmly adhered to the to, to view of realism to peace, uh, North Korea's peace offensive. And North Korea it itself, he kept a perspective of power politics on, in, in the Korean relations. Yeah. Thank you. We have uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, Professor Brzezinski is the busiest member of this panel. He has to go and teach after uh, this panel. So we're going to end promptly at 5 o'clock, giving us 10 minutes for uh, roughly two to three questions. Uh, we have uh, folks in the audience with a microphone. If you could raise your hand, state your name and your organizational affiliation. Uh, please keep your questions uh, very brief and very direct. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Elisa Gerge from Georgetown University, uh, also looking at Romanian documents on North Korea. Uh, my interest, my, my question is for Professor Schaefer, and um, it is a question that has to deal, deal with the ideology. I am curious to see why this urge uh, throughout communist countries, socialist countries, to have a president in place and what happened to the principle of the Marxist Leninist principle of having a collective leadership um, and how I, I noticed in the documents that North Koreans were insisting on communism. They haven't changed the concept in their com uh, discussions. 
but they changed the practice. Of course, if you compare the um, ideology per se, I mean, at very abstract uh, level with the practice, there are huge differences. But this one, for me, is very important because I want to see how Ro why Romania did it at the same time with North Korea. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I can give you a def definitive answer on, th on that one here. Um, well, certainly uh, North Korea at that time didn't have a collective leadership. It was basically like the Chinese model with one supreme leader uh, who did not call himself president because uh, this was a title which was used by the bourgeois uh, states and uh, with with regard to South Korea of course you have really had to keep that in mind I think after, after I think after 1970 after the imposition of the Yushin system in South Korea I think they he really thought they have to be on equal terms in times of titulation that he basically when you had this president for a lifetime in the south you have to have a president uh, in North Korea who's basically on the same inter-Korean level. It can't be that there's a president for a lifetime in South Korea and your highest title is prime minister, which was it at that time. So I think this was rather inter-Korean thing that they changed the title to president. But it didn't change anything with regard to the leadership. And, and certainly Ceausescu got a lot of clues how to govern his party and his country from China. Uh, and from North Korea. I think those three, uh, until the very end, until 1989, where China, of course, changed at some point, but at least uh, North Korea and Romania really uh, were very close in this regard how to, how to govern, how, how the style of, of, of ruling. And there's certainly a, a mutual uh, uh, inspiration uh, by North Korea and Romania early on how to, how to have a one-man rule. Yeah. Thank you. Another question? Uh, if I could jump in, uh, this is a very interesting time. Uh, as Professor Brzezinski mentioned, uh, the key point that struck me in your comments was this idea that you have detente between the United States and China, and then you don't have that lasting between the two Koreas. Uh, Assistant Secretary Kirk Campbell just stated in Beijing that he's never seen a period where there's been greater policy coordination with the Chinese on North Korea in the six-party talks. Uh, so you have Beijing and Washington feeling like they're on the same page. Uh, and we see the two Koreas, although there have been some improvements in key areas, overall the relationship being very difficult right now. Uh, I turn it to our three speakers. Uh, this whole question of history rhyming, as Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but there's a lot of rhyming. Uh, if there are other areas that you could draw on and things that strike you by way of this rhyming, uh, we'd be very curious and very interested in, in your observations there. Uh, directed to no one in, in uh, particular, anyone who would like to take that question. Well, um, you s John said that U.S. and China are on the same page in dealing with the North Korean question, of course, including uh, nuclear weapon uh, problem. Uh, the North Korean question could be different to uh, two different capitals, Beijing and Washington. However, the North Korean nuclear question could be the same as a threat and source of instabilities and, and therefore source of concerns. Therefore, United States and China should cooperate. Uh, no, con no country can deal with this question unilaterally, so uh, they should cooperate. Therefore, in a sense, uh, they should be on the same pages. However, uh, to the question of North Korea itself, I believe that the United States and China could not be identical in the near term and the long term too. Uh, therefore, uh, because the China-North Korea relationship per se exists as a, a set of international relations in Northeast Asia, uh, they share the common interest, uh, they, they have a ideological and political background to cooperate. Therefore, uh, in between uh, China and North Korea, Nuclear is a, just a problem among many other uh, issues of cooperation. And therefore, uh, even if uh, uh, U.S.-China looks very much cooperative in dealing with North Korean nuclear question, however, how to deal with North Korea as a whole, uh, they should not be identical. Therefore, I mean that we need to be a little bit more prudent in reading the real mind of China towards North Korea. In the early 1970s, China 
basically held the North Korean position that there should be one Korean state under North Korean terms. Uh, this has, of course, fundamentally changed. Uh, now China wants to have see the survival of the North Korean state and basically sort of a ongoing status quo division of the Korean Peninsula. Now China is afraid of the unification under southern, southern terms. It has really fundamentally changed now. And back in the 1970s, I think China was much closer to North Korea than to the U.S. Uh, maybe the U.S. really overestimated what China really was up to. I mean, China would have welcomed, I think, a unification under northern terms in Korea, not with military means, not peaceful, of course, not violent, yes, no war, of course. But it would have welcomed a peaceful unification under northern terms with Kim Il-sung ruling, ruling the entire peninsula, if, if possible. Uh. I'm going to add uh, uh, something. Although North Korea, uh, you know, North Korea is uh, afraid of uh, absorbed uh, unification by by South Korea, it does not want to be a subordinate state to China, China uh, either. Uh, in other words, North Korea is running uh, after two two hours, hours nuclear. I mean nuclear. Uh, nuclear armament and normalization of uh, U.S. Uh, North Korea relations as a means uh, to survive uh, through which it can avoid being uh, co-opted by uh, South Korea or subordinate to subordinated to China. Thus, uh, in North Korea's uh, view, China, North Korea relations and inter-Korean relations. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, basically dependent uh, variables or, or parameter, a kind of, uh, I mean, catalyst of uh, USDP relations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us for today's uh, talk, Back from the Brink, Prospects for Inter-Korean Dialogue, Past and Present. Please join me in thanking our speakers today. <laughs>